recording. Yep. Um, so um, there will be, um, yeah, there will be a, um, a guest lecture today. Um, but I think you probably, if you take the course, you probably know the exams coming up. Um, and I just want to say that, well, this material is examinable. So uh, hopefully that's not a big deal for a lot of you. Um, can you hear me at the back? Okay, good. Um, all right, so uh, in this lecture, we're going to talk about a topic um, related to optimization called uh, computational optimal transport. Okay? Um, there's a lot of things related to machine learning in this course, so you probably will be familiar with it. Um, if not, feel free to um, disrupt me. Feel free to raise hand, ask me questions. People online, if you want to ask me questions, feel free to unmute yourself, raise your hand, or put it in the chat. Um, okay, so let's get started with the lecture. Um, Cool. So uh, in machine learning, um, you typically have this uh, approximation problem where you have one probability distribution that's very hard to estimate or computationally intractable to calculate. Um, so what do you do with it? You do it by uh, approximating it. And what, and what happens is you have a set of simpler probability distributions. We call it a family. And we pick in that family a distribution that is the closest to the distribution you're trying to approximate, right? Um, and does anybody remember what kind of distribution, well, what kind of distance between two distributions we typically use in machine learning? Anyone wanna have a guess? Yep. Yes, that's correct, yep. So, um, the typical function that we try to minimize is the kullback leibler divergence between two distributions, right? Um, and this is the definition of the KL divergence. All right. Um, so does anybody remember the, um, what are the characteristics of the KL divergence? Do you remember anything about the characteristics of it? Is it always non-negative? Is it always non-positive or something like that, something. Um, yeah, yeah, I think I, think I kind of know what you're talking about, um, um, but I want to talk about this, this part. Um, so this is just a recap of like some machine learning course that you've taken before, which is that, well, this KL divergence is a function um, that is always non-negative. So um, similar to a distance, distance can never be negative, right? So it's a, a, a non-negative function. Um, and it's always, uh, it's always non-negative and it is zero if and only if the two distributions are exactly equal to each other, right? So that's kind of why uh, we wanna minimize this KL divergence. We want P and Q, the two probability distributions here to be as close to each other as possible, right? By minimizing the KL divergence. Um, if you have taken information theory before, um, you, this probably can be um, familiar to you, uh, but the kullback leibler divergence basically measures the cross entropy, the relative entropy between the two distributions. Okay? Um, but there's one thing that uh, you probably remember or not, uh, and it is that the KL divergence is not symmetric, meaning that, well, to the K in general, KL of P and Q, is not equal to KL of Q and P. Um, so this is this violates one axiom of the definition of a distance, right? Because a distance has to be a symmetric function, right? Which whichever order you use, you have the same value, right? Um, and so uh, you have seen the Bregman divergence before in convex optimization. Uh, similarly, Bregman divergence is not uh, symmetric. Um, and so you know. This is one of the ways um, that we use, but uh, in this lecture, we'll talk about an alternative to the kullback leibler divergence, and let's see if, um, if it's any better than the KL divergence, right? Uh, any question at this point? Any question from people online? Okay, so let's start with the definition of uh, the distance between two distributions. So let's, uh, in this figure, we have two probability distributions, okay? The left one and the right one. And I'll call it the source and the target distributions. 
Uh, we'll talk about why it's called the source and target later. Um, but basically, you can think of each discrete distribution as a histogram, right? It's just a bin. It's just a bunch of bins. And you know for a fact that, well, each bin can never be negative. It's always non-negative. Non and of course, you, if, you sum, uh, if you sum over all the bins of one distribution, you have one, right? Because it's a probability, right? Um, and so the question is, well, let's say if I consider these two distributions as two piles of sand, right? And I want to move the pile on the left to the pile on the right, right? Um, what, what do I do with it? So I want to move some, let's say, um, yeah. Let's say I want to move some mass from this bin to this bin, right? I may not want to move all the mass there is in the bin, but I want to move like a portion of it. But basically you can see that I can move some mass of one bin to another bin in the other distribution, right? So that's why we called it the source and target distributions, right? Um, and um, so the question we have, the combinatorial question we have is, well, how do we move efficiently? So how do we transport the mass on the left-hand side to exactly the mass on the right-hand side, but in uh, the most efficient way possible, okay? So we have to define a few things. We first have to define what does it mean to have what does it mean to have efficiency in your mapping? And the second one is how do we formalize that into an optimization problem? Okay. Um, and so when you move some mass from the, from the left to the right, you will incur some cost, right? And you can see that like, if you move, let's say a mass from this bin to maybe this bin, um, if you move to a closer bin, maybe the cost is lower than moving to a, a further bin, okay? So we're talking, of, we'll, we'll try to formalize that cost a bit later. But is everybody on the same page as me? Any question? Okay. So let's talk about that. Well, let's try to form, um, let's try to formalize that. So we have two um, vectors in here. So each one is two dimensionals. The two vectors are R and C. And by definition, these vectors are non-negative, meaning all entries are zero or higher, and they sum to one each of them, right? So they basically are probability vectors. And you probably have seen before in this course, um, this is, um, yeah, this is an example of a vector belonging to a probability simplex, right? Um, all right, so, um, we will define two things in here. So I will define two matrices. The first matrix is the matrix X. The I, J component of that matrix X is the amount of mass that you move from the I bin of R to the J bin of C, okay? So um, yeah, this is, this is the mass that you move from one bin of the source to another bin of the target. Um, and well, I will also define another matrix, which is C, and it is called the cost matrix, where Cij equals the cost of moving one unit of mass from Ri to Cj, okay? Cool. So if I want to move all the Is to all the Js, and I have a cost matrix of C, could anybody help me with um, figuring out what the total cost of moving all the masses is. Any idea? Well, xij is moving from ri to cj, right? And that amount times cij is the total cost when you move from ri to cj. Does that make sense? Um, and so, if you sum over all the x, uh, ij times cij over all i and j, you will have the total cost. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay. Cool. So we have defined a cost matrix, we've defined a transport matrix, and if you take the inner product of them, so um, this notation, uh, I'll try to... Yeah, this notation is called the inner product of them. It's just a definition, right? Okay? Um, 
And so if you take the inner product of these two matrices, you have the total cost that you incur by moving, right? With the, with the transport map X, okay? And so what we wanna do is we wanna find an X, which is a transport map that minimizes this cost, okay? So, um, well, I think a lot of us would recognize that this is a linear program, right? Because the objective seems like a linear problem. But we have to think about if there's any constraints to this problem, okay? So let's talk about the constraints. Um, so all in all, we need to minimize C times X, right? Minimize with respect to X, okay? So uh, remember that XIJ is the mass transported from RI to CJ, right? So we will try to find out what kind of constraints we have on this variable XIJ. So the first, um, the first constraint is that, well, it has to be non-negative, meaning the mass must flow from, from R to C, right? It cannot flow the other direction. Right? It could be zero, meaning there's no flow, okay? Um, does anybody have any suggestion on what the other constraints might be? Um, there's a question online uh, which asks, how is the cost determined? We'll talk about that part a bit later. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. It should be RI, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's correct. So the, the second constraint, which is basically, you can think of that as a conservation of mass, right? Um, so what it means in here is all masses that flow out of R, right, must be equal to R, right? Flow out of the bin I of R must be equal to R. So this is how we, form, uh, we formalize it. So if you sum over J, so meaning you sum over the column entries, right, of the same row, that means you sum over all the masses flowing out of RI, correct? And that should be equal to RI, right? Because at the end, there shouldn't be nothing left in RI which is why we have this constraint of X times one equals R. Okay. Um, and then I guess similarly, you would have the same constraint for C, right? Um, meaning all masses flowing into the bin J of the target distribution must be equal to CJ, okay? Um, yep, and that's all the constraints that we have. Um, feel free to disrupt me if you have any questions about these. Um, so in the, in the literature of optimal transport, um, the problem we're studying, if you have a matrix X that satisfies the, these three constraints, uh, the matrix X is called a coupling of R and C. What does that mean? A coupling is a joint distribution, meaning that matrix is not negative, it sums to one, right? So that's a joint distribution. And also, if you marginalize X on either direction, you have the marginal constraints, okay? um, which is basically the row and the column constraints that we have there. Okay? So that's just the definition of a coupling matrix. Okay? So moving on to solving the linear program, right? So what we have in here, we have minimize the inner product between C and X, so just C times X, uh, subject to these three constraints, right? So this is a standard problem. Uh, this is a standard linear program, right? Um, and we all know how to solve it. You learn it in a course. Um, so that's, that's the problem of optimal transport between two discrete distributions, okay? And um, well, we've made an assumption that the distributions are discrete. So how can we extend that to two um, the two continuous distributions. Here's how it works. Um, basically, you have the same formulation, but you would have a set of couplings would be the same. So set of all uh, joint distributions with the marginals R and C, right? Um, and then you would also have this cost function similarly to a cost matrix between X and X prime when you have two, when you have X and X prime following the two marginal distributions, okay? Um, does that make sense with everybody? Okay. Um, and so there's one more thing that is quite interesting in here, which is uh, this is a very important 
um, distance metric in machine learning and statistics. A lot of you who have done statistics would know this. Um, and it's called the Wasserstein distance, right? The row Wasserstein distance. And what I do with that is, well, if I raise, if I raise C to the power of rho, right? And then I solve the OT problem. I, I, I solve that minimization problem. And then I, um, and then I raise that to the power of one over rho. Well, you can think of rho equals one or whichever number it is. Um, then I would have uh, what is called the Wasserstein distance, the rho Wasserstein distance, right? Um, and yes, people have proved that this is actually a distance, meaning it's always non-negative. It's zero if and only if the two distributions are the same and it's symmetric as well. So that's different from the KL divergence, right? It is symmetric. Okay. Um, cool. So I will give you an example of how this optimal transport problem works in, um, in, a, in an application in machine learning, okay? Um, this is a method called the, well, the word mover's distance, the, the word mover's distance. Um, and basically what it does is it's trying to find the distance between two documents, right? And meaning if two documents are semantically similar, they should be close together, meaning their distance should be, sh should be small. And if they are semantically dissimilar, the distance should be larger, okay? Um, so raise your hand if you're familiar with word to vec <laughs> um, okay. Uh, cool. Um, well, the people online, you can raise your hand too. Okay. Um, so um, a recap of word to vec This is basically a, a word embedding model, meaning you map all the words that there are in the English language to a high dimensional space. In this case, we just use D, but D could be 100, 200, 300, whatever it is, right? So you move a word, you, you map a word to a, ve to a vector in a d-dimensional um, space, and you want to map them in a way that satisfies some um, conditions. So here's, here's an example of how people use to map these words together. So given a context, the prime blank of Australia, what we want to do is if we query this context on um, word to vec, the d-dimensional space, and we query the word minister and the word governor, it should give you, it should rank the word minister higher than the word governor because it, um, it makes more sense. Um, that's basically the, the idea behind word to vec, right? So you're trying to predict the word in the middle as accurately as possible given some context around that word, okay? Um, all right. Uh, and if you've done maybe document analysis or some natural language processing course, you will know that the word to vec space encodes some very interesting semantic relationships. So here's an example. Let's say you query the word Canberra and the word Australia. So they just give you d-dimensional vectors, right? And you look at the direction that flows from Australia to Canberra, to Ca from Ca yeah, from Australia to Canberra. Um, that direction is approximately equal to this direction that goes from the vector representing Stockholm to Sweden, okay? So what this is trying to do is that, well, it's kind of mimicking the capital to country relationship, right? And so these, this kind of um, embedding is very useful. Um, and what it says in here is that, well, if you look at this high dimensional embedding, um, when, you, when you start with the word Canberra, the vector for Canberra, it's much easier for you to travel from Canberra to Australia than it is from Canberra to say Sweden, right? It's closer for you to move from Stockholm to Sweden then, okay? And so this helps us to define a few things. So um, if you wanna move from one document to another, we have to think about, well, we know how to move from one word to another because that's word to vector, right? But well, if you think about a document, it's it's gonna be a different representation than a word. Um, and so if you wanna move from what, one document to another, um, we have to answer these two questions, which is, first of all, how do we represent a document, right? Because we only have a representation of a word. Um, and the second question is, well, how do we define the cost of moving from word I to word J, right? In our, in our vocabulary. 
Okay. So what's happening here? Uh, if you want to represent a document, the simplest way that you can do it is to consider a document as a bag of words, right? What that means is you count all the occurrences of every word in the vocabulary, and then you just, for every word, you assign it a frequency in that document, okay? So you can think of this as um, a very sparse vector of um, your, let's say, 10,000 word um, vocabulary, right? Um, and of course, you can also normalize it so that it becomes a probability vector, right? So um, yeah, so you will see that most of the entries in that vector are zero, right? Because only a handful of words in, uh, in the vocabulary are present in a typical document, okay? Um, and so now we can represent a document as a probability vector, right? Only if uh, a handful of them are positive. Um, and then we need to define the cost of moving one word to another. So in this case, um, what we do is we look up the word to vec space. And if we wanna move from word say Canberra to word Australia, what we wanna do is we look at the vector for Canberra and the vector for Australia. And we just use the Euclidean distance between these two vectors. Um, and that becomes the cost of moving from Canberra to Australia. Is everybody on board with me? Any question? Any question online? Okay, so, um, well, we have two documents as two probability distributions, right? And we have this cost matrix CIJ, basically 10,000 by 10,000, where 10,000 is the number of words in your vocabulary, right? And so in order to move from one distribution to another, you basically just solve the optimal transport problem, right? Solve the, um, solve the linear program we have in here. Okay, there's a question online, which is, so this measures document similarity versus via transport. That's correct, yeah. So you can think of each document as a, um, as a pile of sand and another document as another pile of sand. And you're trying to move that pile to the other pile as efficiently as possible, okay? All right, so we solve the same problem, right, as before. So we, we minimize the inner product between C and X, where C, we just defined C before, um, and subject to the three constraints that we found, that we formulated before, okay? Cool. Um, so here's an example of how it works. I'll give you a high-level idea. Um, so, uh, in the first figure that we see in here, this is uh, a figure that I took from an ICML 2015 paper on this word movers distance. Um, we have two documents. The first document is Obama speaks to the media in Illinois. And the second document is the president greets the press in Chicago, right? Um, when, you, when you do back of words, typically you would need to remove the stop words, which are the non-bold words in here. So we only care about the bold words. Um, and so if you just if you just look at the two backs of words and you do want to do an inner product between them, these two vectors are orthogonal to each other because they don't have any component um, in common, right? They don't have any word in common. So that means basically there's no semantic relationship between these two documents. However, there is, well, if you read it, you read it, there is, right? Well, this paper was published in 2015 when Obama was still the president. Uh, but yeah, you could easily replace that with Trump or Biden now. Um, and so this, this is an illustration of the word to vec space, where if you want to go from the vector representing Obama, it's much easier for you, it's much easier for you to move from Obama to president than it is to go from Obama to, say, Greece or Chicago, right? So that's just how the space, the word to vec space is constructed, right? It's easier for you to go from Obama to president. And so if you wanna move mass from the document on the left to the document on the right, it's probably more useful for you to move mass from Obama to president than it is to move from Obama to Greeks or press, All right? Does that make sense? Cool. Um, yep. And the right, the right figure basically uh, illustrates you the 
um, this distance. So we have three documents, D0, D1, and D2, D0 in the middle. And we wanna find the distance between D0 and D1 and D0 and D2, right? If you read the, the three documents, the president greets the press in Chicago and Obama speaks to the media in Illinois and the band gave a concert in Japan, well, you will see that well, D1 and D0 should be closer than, it, than from D1 to D2, sorry, from D0 to D2, right? And if you use this, um, if you use this word movers distance, well, there is an implementation. If you use this word movers distance, um, you will find that the distance between D0 and D1 is smaller than D0 to D2, right? Meaning that D0 and D1 have, um, are more semantically similar than um, D0 and D2, right? Um, yeah. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, so then we just solve that optimization problem. We get a distance between two documents, right? Um, so once we have the distance between two documents, we can do a bunch of stuff in machine learning, right? Uh, I give two examples here. You can do k nearest neighbor prediction. So if you have if you have a regression problem, you can do a k nearest neighbor regression on that. Um, if you want to if you want to implement a unsupervised method like clustering, you can use agglomerated clustering in here. Many problems um, that only depend on the distance between two, um, two examples in your training set. Okay. Does that make sense with everybody? Any question? Yeah. Okay. How does one, so there's a question for me online. How does one determine which word maps to which? Well, that's a good question because we don't know, right? We want to solve for X. X is the transport matrix, right? X is the transport matrix. So it tells you that how much do you want to move from this word to the other word, okay? So by solving that optimization problem, we will know um, exactly how much to transport from one, um, from one word to another, right? Does that answer your question? Okay, great. Um, let's move on. So, oh, all right. Um, so here's a simple implementation of that uh, of that optimization problem. So um, you've done your assignment five. You know, CVXPY, right? Um, and so here, this is just a very simple um, linear program where we have what we have uh, the objective. So let me try to write a few things in here. Um, here, the objective, right? It's just the inner product between the cost matrix C and the variable X, right? So in here, I, I flatten this variable X from a matrix to an N squared um, dimensional vector because that's how CVXPY works. Um, and then I encode three constraints in here. So the first constraint is just X greater than or equal to zero, right? We, uh, we don't want negative vectors. Um, and then these, this row, this for loop is for the row constraints, okay? Meaning that, well, whenever you loop over i, you basically sum the ith row of x, okay? And because x is now a serialized um, vector, so you, you need to index it in a little bit different uh, way than you would do with a two-dimensional um, matrix, okay? And you would do the same thing for the row, um, for the row, um, constraints, okay? So now we have an objective, we have constraints, we have variables, we're done. We can define a linear program normally, right? And we can solve it, say, using the simplex algorithm or whichever variant of that algorithm that you learned in this course before, okay? And so we just need to use prop.solve and it solves it for us. We don't need to do anything else, okay? Um, before I move on, does anybody find out a potential problem with this. It's not about the incorrectness, the correctness of this problem, but it's about the efficiency of this problem. Yeah, um, yeah so somebody said online, the back of word is huge dimensions. Yeah, this is a very high dimensional space, right? Well, yeah, the two vectors R and C are very high dimension. and. Um, yeah, that's correct. And so if you look at this problem, you will say, okay, the variables 
our x and its n squared dimension, right? If we have a vocabulary of 10,000 words, that's going to be very hard to solve, right? Because it's going to be 10,000 squared variables that we have. So that's a huge problem with optimal transport. Even if you know how to solve it, it's not going to solve it in, in a short amount of time. So basically, you have a quadratic number of variables. Um, and so we will find a way to reduce the number of variables based on the setting of this problem. Okay? So we'll try to see, well, can we, can we solve this problem with only a linear, a linear number of variables or not? Okay? We have n squared variables and 2n constraints. Right? Um, and so in the rest of this lecture, I'll talk about a technique to solve this, which is, uh, well, two techniques. The first technique is regularization, and the other technique would be duality, okay? So both of them we have already learned in this course. We talked about a strongly convex regularization, and we talked about solving a dual problem. So let's, um, let's talk about the regularized problem. So what I will do in here is I will define a new objective function f of x. And that objective function is equal to the inner product between c and x as normal. And there's an additional term to it, which is minus uh, gamma times h of x. And by definition, that h of x is equal to this one, okay? So um, yeah, so this is the new objective function, okay? The objective function is just the inner product plus the negative uh, of h of x. And if you look closely, you will see that, well, x times log x kind of reminds you of entropy, right? Entropy or cross entropy, whichever you define it to be. Um, and indeed, this, is, this uh, function is actually called the discrete entropy of this matrix. Um, why does it work? Well, it works because X is non-negative, right? So the log makes sense. Well, it actually enforces X to be positive because we don't have a log of zero, okay? Um, and you can, think of, you can think of this term, you can think of this term as basically a regularizer to your objective, right? It's similar to, uh, it's similar to, let's say an L2 regularizer in linear regression or logistic regression, right? So does anybody remember the purpose of regularization? Yep. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so you add a regularizer to an objective function to basically constrain the problem so that the weights of a model don't go too large, right? So it's a way for you to prevent overfitting. Um, but in this course, um, yeah, but in this course, we will, um, we also learned that, well, if we add a regularizer and we know that it is a strongly convex regularizer, right, we'll talk about why it is in a moment, you basically end up with a strongly convex function, right? And a strongly convex function is much easier to optimize than a typical convex function, right? We learned before, if you have a smooth and strongly convex function, um, and we use Gradient descent, it converges linearly instead of sublinearly, right? I'll refer to these parts of the lecture later on. Okay, so um, why do we add this? Why do we add this regularizer? Why don't we add L2? Why don't we add L1? Why don't we add L infinity? Um, you may remember this from the course before, but if you have a, cons but if, if you have a set of feasible variables, Falling into a um, falling into a probability simplex, right? The regularizer you should use is the negative entropy, right? And um, I do not remember what part of the course we talked about that, but definitely we did. So um, basically, uh, uh, basically the the discrete entropy is a strongly concave function okay, with respect to all the axes in the probability simplex. Okay? Um, and so what we do in here is if we add the negative entropy, right? If we add the negative entropy, 
to the objective function, then the objective function becomes um, strongly convex, right? The entropy becomes strongly convex. Um, and we know for a fact that a strongly convex function accepts a unique minimizer, right? This, fun this function now becomes a differentiable function and it's also um, strongly convex. That's why we added it here, okay? Um, and also there's a slight um, side um, consequence of this. Um, and it, it basically forces all the axes to be positive, right? Because you don't have log of zero. And so we kind of, we, we are able to remove that constraint of x greater than or equal to zero before. Um, which leads us to this problem in here. We have the entropic regularized problem. So the function you minimize is the entropic regularized objective. And you only have two marginal constraints to this problem. We have eradicated the x greater than or equal to zero constraint. Um, so we only now have two uh, marginal constraints in here. Okay. Um, since we're running out of time, um, there may be questions about like, well, what kind of, well, what is the regularization strength, right? Um, and how much should I set it to be? Um, so the idea is that, well, if you add this um, entropic regularizer to your problem, then if you vanish the entropic regularizer, meaning that if the, if the regularization strength gamma goes to zero, then you actually um, uh, asymptotically recover the solution to the original problem. Okay? Meaning the smaller, um, the smaller your regularization is, the closer you are to the, um, the original optimal solution. Okay? Does that make sense? Any question? All right, uh, let's move on then. So that's the first technique, adding regularization. The second technique is to use duality, okay? Um, remember, this problem has n squared variables, right? That's from x, but it only has two n constraints, right? Remember, x times one equals r is just n, e uh, n equations, right? And x transpose times one equals c is also n equations. So basically, you just have an, a constraint optimization problem with n squared variables and two n equality constraints. Okay? So if we want to if we want to change the number of variables to the number of constraints, um, all we need to do is to use duality, right? Because we learned from duality before that the dual problem basically swaps the number of constraints and the number of variables for you, right? So you would be looking at a, an optimization problem with only two n variables, so a linear number of variables instead of a quadratic number. So that's why we're using duality in here. Okay, yep. So in order to solve the duality, well, in order to find the dual objective, what we need to do is to find the Lagrangian and we need to, and we need to optimize the Lagrangian with respect to the primal variable X. And so it becomes only a, a, a function of two dual variables. So here's, here's how it is. Um, if I define G and H to be two dual variables, right? G corresponding to, corresponding to X one equals C and H corresponding to X transpose one equals R, sorry, R and C, swap it. Um, I would have a Lagrangian as this. Um, this component is just the, uh, the primal objective. This is the term corresponding to the row constraints and the other one, the column constraints. All right. Make sense, everybody? All right. Um, and so if we want to find the dual function, we just need to um, we just need to minimize it with respect to x, right? So it becomes a function of g and h only. So that's going to be our dual objective. So um, Yep, as I mentioned before, this um, the the primal objective is a strongly convex function, and the Lagrangian, as a result, is also a strongly convex function because it's, you just add two linear constraints, uh, linear functions to it, right? Um, and so all we need to do, because this is differentiable and strongly convex, 
you just need to take the gradient and set it to zero and solve for x, right? Which is why um, this is very simple. Um, so here's how it works. Um, yep, now, um, I won't go too much into the detail of this because we're actually running out of time, uh, but all we need to do is, well, finding the gradient. So in this case, I'm finding the gradient of L with respect to xij for every xij. Um, and I set it to zero. So I set it to zero here, right? And I solve for xij, keeping everything else constant. I would end up with this formula for xij, okay? So what does xij um, depend on? It depends on this gamma, well, we can set that as a constant, right? It depends on Cij in here, which is also a constant because the cost matrix is not supposed to be varied, right? Um, it also depends on these two dual variables. So these are gonna be the variables that we will find, that we will optimize in order to find the solution X, okay? Um, make sense? Any question? Okay, um, cool. Okay, so what I can do um, is that I will rewrite it as something like this. So xij is just a product of three exponents, okay? Um, I moved the negative one before to this, um, to this negative half and negative half in here, right? It's a completely arbitrary decision. You can just put the negative one in the other one and zero on the other. It doesn't really matter, okay? Um, but I just put it in here for the sake of symmetry. Um, and so what I can do with that is I can vectorize everything together, right? What, let's, let me show you how to do that. So first of all, I define this matrix K, uh, the exponent of just exponent of negative C divided by gamma, and we call it a Gibbs kernel matrix in this literature. Okay? So it's basically a constant matrix, right? It doesn't depend on X, or G or H at all. And uh, also if I, depend, if I uh, define U and V to be these two vectors, right? You basically, take, um, you basically take the vector G, divide that by gamma, take the negative minus half out of all components and then raise all components to E, uh, raise E to all of those components. You would have two uh, vectors U and V, right? So basically they are two equivalent ways of, of defining the dual variables. I would be able to uh, express X as this formula, okay? It's basically a, uh, a product of three matrices, the diagonalization of U times K times diag of V, okay? Now, what is interesting about this is that you will see on the left-hand side, we have N squared variables, correct? Whereas on the right-hand side, we only have two n variables. We have u and v, each one is n-dimensional. The k in the middle is just a constant, right? It's a constant matrix. So we can actually um, reproduce the n squared dimensional variable using only two n variables on the right-hand side. So this is the beauty of, of the entropic regularization in, uh, in optimal transport, okay? So, um, so basically all we need to do, well, we know that at optimality, this formula must hold, right? Because we know that the, we know that the uh, optimal solution should be a saddle point of the Lagrangian, right? So the gradient vanishes at that point. So we know that this, this, um, this formula uh, must hold, right? This equation must hold. So all we need to do is to find the U and the V, and then we can reconstruct the solution next. So how do we do that? Um, yeah, how do we find U and V? So I will explain to you an algorithm that is the most widely used uh, when solving this entropic regularized optimal transport. And the algorithm is called Singhorn, okay? Uh, it's proposed by this scientist called Singhorn, I think in the 1960s or 50s. Um, and here's how it works. So if you have, a solution X. If X is the optimal solution, what it must do is it must satisfy the marginal constraints, right? So that's, um, it must satisfy the marginal constraint X times one equals R, right? 
And then what we do is we replace X with the diac K, diac V, right? And that's why we end up with this one. And what else do we do in here? So we will have this um, K times V because diac of V times one is just V, right? And so basically you would have diac u times kv equals r, right? And so what that means is that, well, if you element wise multiply u with kv, you have r. So all you need to do is to divide r by kv for element wise division. And that's how you end up with this, um, this um, formulation down here, which is u equals r divided by kv, element wise division, okay? Um, and you would be doing the same thing for V as well, which is why we end up with this sort of uh, iterative update of U and V. So alternatingly update U, keeping V constant, and then keep U constant and update V, okay? So um, yeah, that's the main idea behind this. Um, I think I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna move on a bit, but I'll send the slides to everybody afterwards if you're taking notes. Um, and so this is very simple because, well, this is just linear, oper linear algebra operations, right? So we can code it in Python really easily. In this case, we don't even need to use CVXP1. We just need to use NumPy. And we need to define a few things. For example, this kernel matrix, right? Um, the two dual variables, U and V. And then we just need to alternatingly update U and V, keeping the other one constant, okay? Um, yeah, so that's the main idea of this, um, of this algorithm. So you just keep one constant and basically update the other one using that formula. Okay. Um, any question for me here about this algorithm? Um, okay. Um, I won't go into the, the details of like how many iterations we need to set. We actually can set the number of iterations. Um, in this case, what you want to do is typically when you when you do an iterative optimization algorithm, you would be checking whether some violation is within your tolerance, right? So we have two kinds of violations in here, the row constraint and the column constraints. And so if, you know, a combination of them falls below some tolerance, which means you can tolerate that solution, then you can terminate the algorithm, right? Um, I will send the code to everybody later. Um, but here is, um, is basically just um, a, a sketch of it. Okay, so um, I actually don't have time to go all into why this algorithm converges and how fast it converges. But basically the idea is you can think of um, Singhorn as basically um, an alternative about as a successive operation of the two dual variables, right? And, you base, and each operation is basically a projection. We'll talk about the details. Um, I talk about the details in the slide. Um, but you basically do this alternating projection of the matrix X, right? And ultimately, that alternating projection will converge to um, a solution within your feasible set um, that will um, minimize the distance. Some distance, well, in here, the distance is um, this callback livelier divergence between your two um, matrices. Okay? Um, yeah, a lot of details in this slide because we don't have time, I'm gonna skip it. Um, and so the final thing I wanna show you is, um, is this, um, these plots. So we have two distributions um, on the top left. We have the dotted distribution R, that's the source. And we have the solid distribution C, that's the destination. We wanna move from source to target, okay? We wanna move from dotted to, from dash to solid. And the cost matrix, as you can see in here on the um, center top, um, you see that closer to the diagonal, most entries are bright because the cost is low. Further from the diagonal, both entries are gonna be dark because that's the distance, right? Um, and if I run Singhorn, you will see that this is the marginal constraint violation. So um, yeah, the, the y-axis, is basically just the two, the sum of the two marginal constraint violation. And I plotted for three different regularization strengths, neg 10 to negative three, negative two, and negative one. So you will see in here that negative one, when, when gamma equals 10 to the negative one, it converges really fast, right? It only took you what, 
a few um, a few iterations to actually converge to a solution with a very low tolerance. But as you re as you decrease the regularization strength, um, you will see that the uh, it converges much more slowly. And this is this is a behavior that we all know in optimization because well, the higher gamma is, the more strongly convex your function is, and the more strongly convex the faster you converge, right? We learned this from, from gradient descent before, right? So that's why um, uh, the lower the regularization, the slower you converge. Um, and finally, I wanna note that there is this uh, effect of regularization strength. So uh, if you go from left to right on the bottom row, you will see that gamma increases. And as gamma increases, the solution, so all of these matrices are the, optimal solution we find after Singhorn, you'll see that as gamma increases, the matrix becomes denser and denser and denser, right? Um, and that's, that's explainable because the, the regularizer we're using is the entropic regularizer, right? So oh, it's the negative entropy. So if you minimize the negative entropies, meaning you maximize the entropy, so your solution becomes denser and denser over time. So that's the, that's the interpretation of that. Um, I want to conclude in one minute, um, which is about the open problems in optimal transport. Um, so there's a lot of open problems in here. Um, and if you are passionate enough about, opti about optimization, you can jump in any of these problems. Um, I do have um, a bibliography. I don't put it in here. But you know, if you find this problem to be useful, it is, uh, it is very popular in machine learning these days. It has always been popular, but it's becoming more and more popular because of diffusion models with all the generative models you see online. So um, yeah, so I'll, I'll conclude the lecture here. Um, I do have a couple of slides at the end, which is about the deep declarative networks um, that Steve asked me to present, but of course we don't even have enough time. Uh, there's gonna be a paper about that. Um, yeah, hopefully, um, I'll be able to answer your questions in the tutorial. Um, but yeah, so the conclusion of this lecture is we talked about the problem of optimal transport. We talked about how to solve it as a linear program. We talked about how uh, entropic regularization and dual duality works. And we talked about how to solve the entropic regularized um, problem uh, for optimal transport using the Singhorn algorithm. Okay? Um, and we also talked about one example of the word movers distance. All right, with all of that, um, I think I should conclude. Thanks.